Uh, good morning. Uh, today we are going to talk to Dr. Carla Zefontein, a senior lecturer, a researcher in the Department of School of Accountants. School of Accountants, yes. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you very much, and I'm very grateful to sit here with you today. Uh, Doctor, can you share with us how did you become a researcher? Uh, I would love to tell a very nice story, but it was absolutely by chance. Um, I graduated, or I completed my honours in accounting in 2010 at the University of Pretoria. Um, it's more, for, oh, actually more known, or better known as CTA, but we were still able to obtain a full degree without any research component. So when I started working here and I considered doing a master's, I was completely dumbstruck by research and everything it entails. Um, but the outcome was luckily that I fell in love with the field that I was happy enough or, or privileged enough to enter and I became passionate about sharing my findings from both my masters and PhD with the public. So I, I think I fell in love with the process of there's a problem that you identify and that you have the skills and the ability to solve it. So yes, it is per chance that I'm known, now known as a researcher. I should actually not be sitting here at all. <laughs> Thank you so much. Right, Doctor, can you share with us what are you currently working on? Okay, so I have recently completed my PhD, so I only um, got my degree last year, so I was attending my own graduation ceremony in April. So currently I'm working on a range of articles to just share the findings from my PhD on a more public platform. but. What I'm doing can be summarized in, in one line, and that line says that specifically in South Africa, the majority of higher education students come from a background where finances have always been under strain. So they are seeking affordable, relevant education that will ensure employability. So everything that I do focuses on two components. The one is the affordability of education, and the relevance of education with the view of employability. And that's the articles that we're writing. How can we address affordability and relevance? Thank you so much. And then coming to the artificial intelligence. Yes. What role can you play in School of Accounting? Well, I recently read very interesting statistics surrounding chat GPT. So chat GPT has been a buzzword specifically in academics because it suddenly became every student can do anything, they just ask chat GPT. But chat GPT was, um, I don't know whether it was enrolled or enlisted, I'm assuming it was a test in accounting, an accounting class, and it failed the accounting class or the test. It got a 47.4%. So for me, that's good. It means that our examinations and our tests are still too difficult for artificial intelligence. But on the other hand, I don't ever think technological advancement is a bad thing. I think if we can learn to manage it, and that is part of the relevance of education that, that I am very passionate about and that I'm researching, is what skills do graduates need to remain very relevant in a world of artificial intelligence, of disruptive technologies, um, to be employable in a business environment dominated by the fourth industrial revolution. For accounting specific, I know it is a hot topic where students actually ask us in class, but will we still get a job? Yes, you will get a job. The thing is just we need to teach you the skills that even AI can't replicate. And from everything that I've read, this actually entails a much more integrated approach to everything we do and a higher level of decision making and um, argumentation which um, at this point there is no computer program that can take all these different aspects and the humanity component and make decisions based on that. So we need to change the way that we teach our students so that they don't just focus on the technical side, specifically of accounting, but to actually move towards decision making where they can integrate a lot of information and then with this human side make the best decision. So there's hope. There's definitely hope. Coming back to accounting, 
immediately when one talks about accounting, you will be referring to ethics and accountability. So what role do they play in accounting field? Ethics and accountability, I think, remains one of the biggest foundations on which our whole profession is built. So we all know that it has become, or accounting has received a lot of negative publicity, and our reputation has really been damaged. But it remains a platform that we cannot do without. So unfortunately, accounting and auditors, it's a profession that the public rely on to make decisions. The public relies on them to evaluate whether businesses are truthful in what they present. Um, it influences investing decisions. It influences pension funds. It influences so many things that the moment that we say, you know what, stuff happened um, that had a very negative impact on profession, but that's not too serious. It's very serious. And everything we do, I can honestly say, I, I just came from a situation we had to address an ethical problem with, with one of our students. If we let those things go as early as uh, a university education and we say it's not significant, we are losing the battle. We need to address it as something we, we do speak about to our students. We have additional workshops. We have um, a lot of external lectures coming in. We have people in the business environment coming specifically to talk to our students to highlight that ethics and accountability remains fundamental for our profession to actually survive. Thank you so much, Doctor. And then, taking into consideration the new developments, are there any exciting gaps within the field of your study? Well, my study, if I, if I go back to focusing on affordability of higher education and relevance, the main gap for me is that many researchers have identified that, that tuition fees globally have increased over the past decade um, and significantly increased. But there's very few researchers who actually go and look at why. Why are tuition fees constantly increasing? Why has um, a university education become unaffordable for a lot of students? Um, and if we go to the relevance, there's also been a, an identification by researchers that there's a gap between the skills of our graduates and the needs of employee, uh, uh, um, employers. But there's very few researchers who said, but why aren't we addressing that? Why isn't there enough funds available to upskill academics? So we identify the problem, but we almost lack the ability to move towards a solution. So everything I do, I try to go and say, all right, we see this, but why? Because if we can know why it's happening, we can start addressing it. Thank you so much. What, what message can you share with aspiring researchers? What I've learned from my own studies at this point, which made me a researcher, really, is that you need to identify a problem that, that really gets under your skin. And then you need to give it all you've got to solve it. If you can do that, you will be successful. If you can add to that, study leaders or a promoter that's as passionate or is as irritated by the problem and passionate about solving it, you've got a winning recipe. Thank you so much. Doctor, apart from research, what are your other interests? Okay, so I first and foremost remain an academic. So I'm definitely passionate about my students. So I come from a long line of teachers um, on both sides of my family, even in my in-laws, on my in-law side. But for me, it's more than, than teaching the technical side. So I aim to have students who walk out of my class and, and really believe in themselves. I think students often miss that they are the future CEOs. They are the future decision makers. They are the future treasurers and um, the owners of big businesses. And the moment that I tell them, but do you realize that you are the future? It's not me anymore. It's almost as if nobody's ever told them that or they haven't realized that. But more than that, and I, I have to go to the cliche, but they have the ability to go out and really make the world a better place or at least better than it was yesterday. So if I say I'm passionate about my students and teaching, to me I'm more passionate about getting students who look at the world objectively, 
and not just go with everything social media tells them or um, politics told them or everybody else, their peers tell them. But to say, you know what, I am the decision maker of the future and I need to make my own decisions. And if I can teach them how to make good decisions that will change the world, I think I have achieved my passion. On a less academic side, I'm a runner, so my mom will tell you that I've been running since I was 10 months old. And now that I have my own kids, 10 months is really little, and I've not stopped. <laughs> so I think it's become more than a hobby, it's become a survival tool. So throughout my studies and working and researching, I feel that when I'm running, I solve the world's problems. So yes, I love running, but then I'm passionate about people walking into my presence and walking out really knowing that there's hope and that they can make a difference. Okay, thank you, Doctor. And then the last note, can you share with us about mental health? This part that we are always ignoring mm. and it's affecting us in the long run. What well, message can you share with us? Well, I just told you that running has become a survival tool. And I think it's a great way to, to emphasize that every single person, and I mean that's bigger than just research, it's um, in your job, it is if you're a student, have to find something where they can just be. Because if there's not one or two hours in a day where everything else just fades away, and you can just grab your thoughts, gather your thoughts, work through traumatic events during that day or stressful events, you will not make it. Um, and I cannot emphasize enough that mental health is very important and that if you identify anything that makes you worried about your own mental health, that you need to address it immediately. So I've had students sitting in front of me where they've almost realized that there's an issue much too late in the process that now it is truly an issue. But when you identify um, a form of burnout or the fact that you just feel tired for five days in a row and there's no reason, it's not like you weren't sleeping or anything, that you'd rather go and address it immediately by talking to somebody, getting professional help, um, even going to the doctor and just saying, let's, let's sort out the physical side that I know it's not physical, but it's truly something that I need to address with a mental health expert. Um, I think if you can do that, then mental health will be something that can be to your advantage. Because mental health also means that when you have power over your mental health or control, it is where your motivation lies. It is where your inspiration lies. It is where the joy in what you do lie. So we need to, to keep that under control and we need to use our mental health to our advantage. So it's definitely the same with physical health, that you have to detect anything that you're worried about early and address it. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Doctor, and then we really appreciate your time. And thank you for inviting me. It's really a privilege to sit here and know that what I'm doing might have relevance to, to anybody out there. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you.